Hello and thanks for joining us. Coming up on this week's film show, Spike Lee finds the funny side of white supremacy in his latest film, Black Klansman. The Last of Us tracks one man's migration over two continents and we check out a Vilmos Sigmund retrospective. I'm happy to be talking to a true white American. God bless white Americans. We're on a roll, baby. When you hire somebody like Bill Moose, you know you're hiring talent and you're hiring somebody that's knowledgeable. I'm joined by film critic Lisa Nesselson. Hello, niece Lisa. This Hello, week. Olivia. Well, we're starting off with Spike Lee's latest film. That had its world premiere in the Cannes Film Festival in May, where it won the Grand Prix, and it's coming out in France now. This film came out in the US on August 10th, and that was to coincide with the one-year anniversary of the Charlottesville protest marches that actually left one woman dead due to the extreme violence of a white supremacist. And there is a link to that present-day violence in this film, Black Klansman. Tell us more. Well, Black Klansman is an incredibly satisfying and deeply pertinent movie based on the true experiences of one Ron Stallworth, uh, the first African-American to join the Colorado Springs, Colorado police force in the mid-1970s, as recounted in his 2014 memoir. Now, Lee and his three co-screenwriters have remained true to the facts of Stallworth's unnervingly surreal investigation, while adding embellishments that I would say strengthen the filmic storytelling. Why the title? Well, Stallworth noticed an ad in his local newspaper inviting people to just find out more about the Ku Klux Klan. So, as like any detective would, he picked up the phone to find out more. And uh, that incredibly led to him infiltrating the Ku Klux Klan on both the local and national levels. In other words, a black man using his own name became a card-carrying member of an organization that despises black people and Jews, and just about any other category that isn't white and Christian. Now, how did he pull that off while gathering important information about pending violent Klan activities? You'll just have to read the book and see the movie. Now, what were the mid-70s like, <laughs> Do you tell may us. ask? <laughs> well, for starters, absolutely everybody wore their hair in an afro, also known as a natural. Here's a picture of me from the era in which this funny, suspenseful, and edifying film is set. Yes, that Unphotoshopped is that and authentic. Unphotoshopped, I authentic might point Polaroid. Out. Okay, not everybody wore a natural, but me and Angela Davis definitely did, and Ron Stallworth, played in the movie by John David Washington, who happens to be Denzel Washington's talented son. Let's take a look at Black Klansman. Hello, this is Ron Stallworth calling. Well, who am I speaking with? This is David Duke. Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. That David Duke? God. Last time I checked. What can I do you for? Well, since you asked, I hate blacks. I hate Jews, Mexicans, and Irish, Italians, and Chinese. But my mouth to God's ears, I really hate those black rats. And anyone else, really, that doesn't have pure white Aryan blood running through their veins. So the film does have KKK in the middle of the title, but given that the tone is really very funny, you might think that the men in the pointy hats are just buffoons, harmless, but in fact, how dangerous are they? Well, that's an interesting question. Quentin Tarantino did a brilliant job of lampooning the losers and buffoons aspect of the Klan and Klan wannabes in his Django Unchained when a Klan-style posse wants to go on a torchlight raid on horseback, but nobody can see out of the eye holes in their homemade <laughs> sheets. Bummer. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan Klan is an abominable secret society that struck terror throughout the American South, dating back to the Civil War. Their repertoire includes charming things like setting fire to crosses at night. Since the Africans forcibly brought to America and their descendants tended to believe in spirits, those creepy white robes actually had a major effect on recently freed slaves. Now, on page 110 of that book, uh, David Duke, who is still a powerful figurehead in the Klan, tells Ron how you can tell when a, here he uses a deeply derogatory term that starts with N and rhymes with trigger, is on the phone. It's hard to say what's more scary and ironic, that D Duke authoritatively tells a black man that he can always tell when he's speaking to a black man, when obviously he cannot, or the fact that David Duke is still a dedicated clan figure 40 years later. Okay, so these are quite serious themes then tackled in the film. Ca 
Can we say it's a film for the whole family? Uh, well, I'd certainly recommend it because it's funny and suspenseful and educational. But the Christian movie review site movieguide.org thinks it's an overwrought, angry, and racially charged film that exists only to fan the flames of racism. This is what we in the trade call missing the point. Uh, what I like about Christian movie review sites is that they take the time to generate statistics that I wouldn't have the patience to gather for myself. So, quote, under the category foul language, at least 100 obscenities, mostly F-words and S-words, and 15 profanities, obscene gestures, and many racial slurs. And under miscellaneous immorality, racism, movie incites anger, shedding more heat and hate than light and love, and gambling occurs. Watch out. Spike Lee was asked at his con press conference why he felt he had to have characters say the N-word so much since it's a disturbing and hurtful term. And Lee, slightly taken aback, explained that his characters speak that way because that's how a great many people actually spoke 40 years ago. Okay, so they've uh, been accurate, I suppose, as in as far as they could be. Now, French cinema goers have long been fans of Spike Lee, and last week, Do the Right Thing was re-released in a restored version, and then, then next week, Miracle at Santa Ana, which never got a full release here, just a festival one, is coming out a decade later. I have to say, I admire Do the Right Thing uh, for its contrarian New York energy, uh, but it's not a film I've ever actually liked, but it's important, and everybody should see it at least once. Let's take a look. Hey, hey, Sal, how can we get the brothers on the wall here? You want brothers on the wall? Get your own place. You can do what you want to do. You can put your brothers and uncles and nieces and nephews, your stepfather, stepmother, whoever you want. You see? But this is my pizzeria. American Italians on the wall only. Take it easy, man. Huh? And you, hey, don't stop me today. What? Yeah, that might be fine, Sal, but uh, you, you own this. Rarely do I see any American Italians eating in here. All I see is black folks. So since we spend much money here, we do have some sex. Now, as for Miracle at Santa Ana, it's a story worth telling, but alas, clumsily told. Hardly anybody went to see it 10 years ago uh, in the countries where it was shown, and there was extensive, there were extensive legal battles involving money people in the US, Italy, and France. Uh, so the story is in the 18, uh, 1980s, 1980s, an elderly black man does something shocking. The film then reverts to flashbacks, and it's set mostly at the end of World War II in Italy. We meet four Buffalo soldiers from the segregated 90s 2nd Infantry Division, and Lee, whose film is based on a book by the acclaimed black writer James McBride, wants to show how brave and heroic black American soldiers were, even though they were fighting essentially for uh, white people who didn't like them or outright hated them. This is a bit of an indulgent cinematic oddity with some incredibly affecting battle scenes, but too much uh, uncharacteristic melodrama for Lee. Okay. Well, most of Spike Lee's work is about social struggle in contemporary uh, America, and this next film tackles that as well in a very different way from a different angle and in a different place. The Last of Us is a dialogue-free conceptual drama about a man who leaves sub-Saharan Africa hoping to, to get a better life across the Mediterranean. Does he succeed? Well, a lot depends on what you mean by succeed and a better life. He's definitely uh, encountering a different life. So different, in fact, that even saying that this is a conceptual piece of work can't fully prepare the viewer for what transpires. This debut feature premiered in the Venice Film Festival two years ago, which under underscores the excellent point that there's no such thing as an old film, just a good one or a less good one. A French distributor decided to release it here in France. I think what the film sets out to explore is whether there are times when you should reject the surroundings that fate has assigned to you, or do you endeavor to blend in? The question of refugees and immigrants and displaced persons looms over contemporary life, especially here in Europe, so any attempt to address it through art is absolutely welcome. That said, I'm not sure this venture is rewarding enough. Uh, the film begins with striking footage of two dark-skinned men traveling through desert terrain on foot with absolutely minimal possessions. Jackets, scarves, a compass, a small backpack each. After a great deal of walking, they arrange to be transported in a truck, which turns out not to be such a great idea because they get separated. Okay, so can we say that on this journey, travel necessarily broadens the horizons? Uh, well, our pro protagonist's horizons definitely expand, but he's as far as you can get from a dilettante. Uh, on the subject of travel, this, this verbal tick that has caught on of late in the English language, which is to call every project a 
journey, you know, a, a journey to get a play produced, a, a journey to not consult social media every five seconds, a journey to find a palatable bacon cheeseburger. Uh, this film gorgeously depicts a bona fide journey in the true meaning of the word, not one that massive amounts of viewers will want to take, but there is something there. Okay. Well, you mentioned uh, French distributors and how they work sometimes very creatively, releasing a film a few years after it was made. The model here in France is quite clever at getting around obstacles, and I think you've got another good example. Oh, a very good example. There are still quite a few independent cinemas where they show movies, they go out of their way to program things that the staff actually likes, not just what happens uh, to be offered. One Paris art house that takes this hands-on approach to programming is the Grande Action, Grand Action in the Fifth Arrondissement. They're very good at retrospectives. In the entire month of August, they've been showing movies shot by the late, great Hungarian cinematographer Vilmos Zygmunt. Here are a few titles you might recognize. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, The Deer Hunter, Heaven's Gate, Deliverance, The Rose. He was an absolute master of distinctive cinematography in the service of the story. Now, here's a true chain of events I absolutely love. The projectionist at the Grande Action is a Frenchman named Pierre Filmon. If you divide his last name into two syllables and say it to Eng in English, you get film on. Destiny. Uh, when he tried to get his first feature as a director off the ground, he approached Film and Sigmund about shooting it. That didn't come to pass. But he started shooting a documentary about Zygmunt, and the result, Close Encounters with Vilmos Zygmunt, was shown at Cannes two years ago, ran at the Grand Action for months, and has just been released, just been released as a DVD with a cornucopia of extra. Zygmunt, by the way, was an immigrant to the U.S. He escaped Hungary in 1956, and his contribution to cinema was spectacular. Okay, Lisa, thank you very much for the tip off there. We'll leave you with a clip of Close Encounters, which might prompt you to check it out if you are in Paris. Do you remember to check out our website though for more arts and culture and you can also keep up with Encore on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. After Sugarland Express I didn't work with uh, Spielberg and, uh, and Jazz and telling the truth I didn't like the subject I thought it was great for kids you know sharks eating people you know it was I didn't realize that he's going to make, make, make a great film like that. But I definitely wanted to do closing countries of a third kind, which he already promised me that I will do whenever he's going to finish jazz. <laughs> 